Well, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Somebody, of course, has to stop the party, and I chose the short straw this evening. Uh, we're going to rely on Lord Winston to sort of lighten it up a little later on. Um, I very much enjoy coming back to this part of the world. I spent um, many of my sort of formative years here in my business life working in the West Midlands. And um, at that stage, building uh, what became a quite a well-known FTSE 100 industrial conglomerate. We built it on um, the somewhat shaky foundations, I have to say, of some very difficult businesses then, some forges, some foundries, and some pretty unloved engineering companies. This is all in the early 80s. And they were all scattered across the black country. Now, through a lot of acquisitions that um, we did at that time, Williams Holdings eventually transformed itself into a global fire protection and security business with uh, the famous Chubb name. But its roots as a business were here. And the lessons that I learned in business as a supplier to the motor industry, I have to say, were to be absolutely invaluable to me for the rest of my career. Now, in the fairly tough and unforgiving business climate of the 80s, it, it taught me three lessons. First, that great performance was rarely delivered without a thoughtfully constructed and a well-communicated plan. Secondly, that, that good leadership repeatedly liberated extraordinary talent from seemingly ordinary people. And finally, adversity invariably brought out the best in a team. And when you think about it, what applies to a company clearly applies in the same measure to a country. And in today's world, we are certainly not short of adversity. The Eurozone just continues to cast a, a dark shadow over the UK. And I think as we all hear and see and listen to the news, it's pretty evident that there isn't going to be any short-term improvement. Now, uncertainty, and that's what we're talking about, always does impact business. It inhibits the brave, and it very often completely paralyzes the timid. And what that does is to encourage you know, balance sheet hoarding, and it, it simply discourages expansionary investment. Now, I have to say that, from my perspective again, good leadership will typically rise above that kind of pessimism. And it will pursue opportunities that are there for everybody to see, but sadly, only a few to actually follow. And we've got some great examples here in the West Midlands. We've got Jaguar Land Rover, we've got GKN, we've got JCB, to name but only three of the greats. And these are all, for me, living proof that good companies can prosper in bad times. It's the strong leadership, investment, it's reaching out for new markets that creates real global success. And that in turn obviously trickles down the economy and provides opportunity for the supply chain, it creates jobs, and it builds prosperity for others. Now, those companies, they haven't looked to government to provide solutions or guarantees. They've looked to government to provide the right climate, and they've never relied on themselves to capitalize on the opportunities and, in so doing, to deliver the goods. They and others, I think, have harvested the advantages that we all enjoy. Our language and location, our universities, the excellence of the collaboration that we see between university and business, 
our flexible markets, which absolutely now encourage inward investment, good labour relations, a pro-business government, and fortunately a tax structure that starts to favour business and businessmen. We've also got, and we've got a lot of it in this room, great expertise in design, creativity, and some really world-beating strengths in precision engineering, in low carbon, in high tech, and of course, the service industries. But it's only going to be by multiplying these successes many times over that we are, as a country, going to achieve sustained recovery. And to achieve this in scale, um, we've, we need a, a fresh look at what we would term, I think, an industrial policy. I think as a starting point, we need to recognize where we sit within the global economy and set out just where we think we want to be in the years ahead. It, it needs, in other words, a clear and thoughtful plan. We need to stimulate the long-term investment in the UK's production capacity and future capabilities. And I think that's as much about changing the culture as it is about changing the policies. Importantly, we want to turn, I think, well-meaning platitudes, which we hear a lot about industrial policy, into a well-grounded proposition. And the CBI intends to produce a proposal for a new industrial policy which will be published by the autumn. And we're going to be seeking input from you in the preparation, what I think will be an important document. Our broad direction of travel seems clear um, and, and really hangs together on a number of basic principles. We, we know, and I think we all know, that a policy of this sort will work best if it's actually in tune with and shaped by people who are actually in business, you know, rather than people who are purely academics or purely politicians. The thinking needs to come from the business community. We know that strategy will only work if it's adopted across government and that the culture and the practices of different departments within government you know, are actually aligned to become mutually supportive. And that's Biz and DEC, the Treasury, Education, all working together with a, a joined up agenda. And for anybody, and I think many of you here actually do interface with government, you know, we all know just what a tall order that is. But it is, it is a fundamental in providing the bedrock of a policy. To be effective, it's got to be ambitious, clearly. It's got to be consistent. And there's got to be a, a coherent and intelligent and a very focused strategy, which is all about delivery. The test, I think, is every action in any government department must be pressure tested against the growth agenda because that's what this is all about. Nothing else will do. There cannot and there must not be any fudging of this as our collective priority. If we get this right, we can create an industrial policy that is much more than the sum of the parts. There have been previous attempts to pick winners, and I think we're all very sceptical about that, and I think the, the principle is, is rightly derided. And some of us, although I have to say looking around the room, not many of us, but looking in the mirror, um, I am certainly old enough to remember that when Triumph production was moved from Birmingham to speak, and it was a complete disaster of social engineering, it just did all the wrong things for the wrong reasons. And in many ways, the fault always lies in picking out um, an individual company rather than identifying a sector where the UK has true competitive advantage. 
And the failures of past industrial policy can't be allowed to prevent us from trying to create a new one. And I think we can look across the world for others that have done this with degrees of success and try and learn some of the lessons. In the States, the US has a very much a mission-driven approach. And it's a commitment to innovation through government risk-sharing. And it's a policy that seems to have worked. It spends about 2.8% of GDP on R&D, whereas we spend about 1.8%. But as a result, the US has got 21 of the world's top 50 most innovative companies. Germany, we all look to Germany for, particularly now with their great industrial success, but we look rightly to them for, again, lessons to be learned. A consistent approach to industrial policy working across the government and across party lines. It's tailored support, it's cut red tape, it's successfully targeted exports and green technology. And it's done that with real clarity of purpose. The banks work with business to provide secure financing, particularly for the mid-caps, and to encourage the whole of the industrial environment in long-term thinking and growth. And I'm hopeful that the moves by the Bank of England last week at least go some way towards facilitating this kind of behaviour in the country. It's a vital piece of the recovery process that we need. Now, for the Germans, you know, the impact of this kind of policy, which they've had for many years, is very evident for all to see. They exported £55 billion worth of goods and services to China last year. We exported less than 9 billion. And without Jaguar Land Rover, might have been even half that amount. Is that fair, Ralph? No, probably not. But, I mean, th that's the kind of number differential that we see. Th their culture is of ownership and of stewardship. It's not only about short-term financial gain, and that's something the UK has got to think a lot more about in its own policy thinking. Now, what works abroad, you can't bring here and impose it. You can learn from pieces of it. The British industrial policy has got to draw from the success of those people, but it's going to need three basic qualities, which are very specific to the UK. It's going to need to be flexible. It's got to have enough dynamism to ensure that it can be resilient to short-term pressures, which are very evident here in this country. And it's got to be capable of adapting quickly to shifts in demand. There's got to be long-term certainty for investment, looking not just at tomorrow, but 10 years and beyond. There's got to be some sort of cross-party consensus, if only in broad direction, rather than worrying about the fine detail. And very importantly, there's got to be a tax system, an R&D policy, and a government procurement policy that can be relied upon and not subject to the sort of whims of political fashion. And that's a message to all parties. Business has got to have faith that the goalposts won't be moved once they get on the pitch. There's got to be a balance between realism and optimism, not attempting to take on the competition in every market, but instead working with the, the grain of our strengths here and building capabilities around those areas of real comparative advantage. A pro-business climate, certainly, that encourages innovation to set up and expand here. A government that is engaged and in industrial policy, not meddling in execution detail. An education system producing enterprising, skilled people with a will to work. Export-led growth underpinned by a supportive foreign office, which I think we actually have, and a business-friendly finance sector, and most important of all, a manufacturing sector that inspires people to work within it. Now, there's no doubt that we're making progress. Government has made, obviously, some rather embarrassing errors of judgment in recent times, but overall, 
They've shown a willingness to support business in tax policy, in entrepreneurial encouragement, and some of the red tape reduction. Never enough, but progress has been made. The, the challenge, I think, of the government isn't about intent, it's not about mindset, it's about speed of delivery. The education policy is being addressed. Reading, writing, arithmetic are back in fashion, and learning a language has re-emerged as a priority. But today, we've still got far too many young people leaving school lacking basic skills. Infrastructure is recognised as a key driver of recovery, and everybody gets that. But the shovel-ready projects continue to be delayed by bureaucracy and, to some extent, dither. Everybody knows we have a looming energy crisis in this country. But whilst the policy may be taking shape, the detail still remains elusive. And we in business, I think, have also got more to do, pursuing new export markets, certainly, training more people, and demonstrating, and I think very importantly, by the way, we pay ourselves and govern ourselves, that we don't need more government intervention to tell us that doing the right thing still remains the right thing to do. So we need a joint effort, government and business working together to reignite growth, to generate employment, particularly for the young, and to bring <coughs> lasting rewards for all. The lessons I learnt um, about 30 years ago were working with working with people like people here today. People who are used to being at the sharp end of business. Very much the kind of business that still prospers and grows in the West Midlands. Typically seasoned, experienced, pragmatic and determined, no-nonsense and plain-speaking professionals who know how to make a profit the hard way. Those lessons were invaluable to me then, and more than ever today, we need that kind of expertise, that kind of experience, and most of all, that kind of edge to help shape our future for tomorrow. You're going to be part of that, and I thank you all in advance for all that you will do to contribute to that plan and to confirm to you all, as ever, on behalf of the CBI, our huge gratitude for the support that so many of you give day in, day out, to make the CBI functionally sound, effective and at the heart of the business community. It's all very much appreciated. Finally, tonight, my thanks again to Deloitte for being tonight's headline sponsor to Chiltern Railways and the Birmingham Metropolitan College for their support. But to all of you, um, I thank you for all that you do. I wish you well in all that you will do in your businesses, and I wish you most of all a thoroughly enjoyable evening. Thank you.